said that it was what you desired, a life of mercy. May we be merciful. And God, we love you. And we give you all the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, some days I'm going to take all of our electronic stuff and just throw it out the back door and go yeah. get outside here and amen. gather around and talk about the word. <laughs> So, Merry Christmas. Uh, I know some of you are excited about Christmas. Scott is not excited about Christmas, but Merry Christmas to him. Anyway, it's December 1st, 2nd, and we're actually after Thanksgiving, so I think I'm safely within the window to get to issue you a stout Merry Christmas. And I have a, uh, a distinct pleasure this morning, honor really, uh, something that can never be taken away from me, and that I am the first person, I think, to preach to baby Hazel Faith. So I am the first person to get to preach the gospel to her, although I'm sure that her dad and mom have already preached the gospel to her, but from uh, from a pastoral perspective. So I better do well today, and uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, doing the best that I can for, for that particular reason alone. So again, Merry Christmas. Uh, I know uh, right up front, uh, we're going to talk about Christmas a little bit, and I want to open with a confession, and is that, that is that I hate, I hate the Elf on a Shelf. Maybe some of you love the Elf on a Shelf, some of you, Miss Christie's like the Elf on the Shelf guru and puts the rest, I don't know, it is, not, anymore. not anymore, we, we bench the Elf on the Shelf. I'd like the, the person that invented the Elf on the Shelf, I'd like to have words with that man or woman, whoever that is. Because uh, you know the deal, I, I do it well for a day or two, we try it, then we forget, we feel guilty, and then the dog gets the elf, and then everybody's putting on Facebook all the cool little neat ideas they have with the elf on the shelf, and uh, it's just too much pressure, I can't handle the pressure of the elf on the shelf, and I'm kind of joking about that, but kind of not, uh, because uh, Christmas for a lot of people means pressure, it does, it means pressure. And I was just reading an article in, uh, in the Drudge Report this last week about 25% of Americans still being in debt from last year's Christmas. If you think about that, 20, a, quarter, a, quarter, a quarter of Americans, 25%, are so enslaved to things and materialism and consumerism and really enslaved to your children that we would put ourselves in debt for over a year to provide you know, things that are probably long since broken, forgotten, or even lost. You know, how many, how many of our kids are still playing with the things that they got over a year ago? Uh, mine probably can't find the things they had just a couple months ago. And so Christmas is a lot of pressure for a lot of people. Now, I've been there. You know, we were there at one point in time. I'm not casting judgment on anybody that still might be in that situation because we were there. Now, we, our family, we've moved pretty well past that you know we don't go overboard we're not we're not too uh enslaved to commercialism and consumerism uh at this point in time but there's a different kind of pressure i felt as a believer the last couple of years and that is the the pressure to get christmas right that i want to get christmas right that i i got to be reading the uh you know the christmas story to my children every single night that i got to do the advent calendar that i got to generate some sort of hyper spiritual season and i love christmas i absolutely i love christmas season and i mean to me it is the most wonderful time of the year but in confession the reasons that i love christmas have nothing to do ritual and sentimentality, which there's nothing wrong with tradition. Just because something's not in the Bible, that doesn't make it non-biblical or unbiblical, but it is when tradition masquerades as biblical practice, that's when we have an issue. But I absolutely love Christmas. I, I cherish it because, again, I'm, I'm a fairly sentimental uh, fellow, and so I, I love this time of the year. But I've always felt this pressure to get Christmas right. And we even started a number of years ago, we would uh, volunteer our family to do service during the Christmas season. And, uh, and, it, and so we went to the Salvation Army a time or two and down there. And, and the, really the culmination of this was uh, we went to the Warm Souls Christmas uh, meal at Hilldale, which is an awesome meal. They, put, they feed you know, hundreds of people. And I found myself a couple of years ago in line. I was standing in line with about 30 other people. To take a plate of food, walk 20 feet, and set it on a table in front of a hungry person, 
and then go get back in line again to wait in line to carry. And I probably, there were so many volunteers, I probably ended up only carrying maybe five plates of food from the kitchen to sit in front of hungry people. I mean, you actually had to wait in line to do this. And it just occurred to me, it's like, what, what are we doing? You know, that we would seek to surge during the Christmas season. That we ought to be serving year-round. We ought to be teaching our children about Jesus year-round. So here at the way, and, and i got to tell you, in confession, one of the most is write a special Christmas sermon series. So this year, we're going to do like we always do. We're going to praise and worship the Lord, and we're going to preach the Word of God. And we're going to remove the pressure to get Christmas right while you are here at the way. And my prayer is that we will, we will do this. But those other things are not necessarily bad things. You know, those, those could be good things. But when you have to surge during the Christmas season to generate a hyper-spiritual kind of season, and then you just go back to doing the things you were doing after the Christmas season is over, then that is an issue. So we're going to preach through the book of Jude for the next four weeks. And maybe we'll end up finding out that there is a tie-in with the Christmas message after all. So we're going to be in the book of Jude as we talk about being kept. And I've entitled this series that we're going to do, Being Kept. So we're going to be in Jude chapter 1, if you have your copy of God's Word. And we're going to do one verse today. We'll get to it, I promise. <laughs> Word of God says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called... Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So we're going to do that one verse, the introduction to this letter. Now Jude, is a, there's a couple of different people named Jude in the Bible. It says he's a, the brother of James. And there's a couple of different people named James in the Bible. And scholars generally agree that Jude and James are the half-brothers of Jesus, brothers of one another. And Jude is a pretty influential dude. And, and I mean, he's included in the, the canon of Scripture here. And this letter was written as a circular letter, much like the, the, the letter of 1 John or the book of 1 John that we finished studying about a month ago. This is a circular letter. And right up front, I want to spend a, a couple minutes talking about the address of this letter. Who is he writing to? He is writing to those who are called. To those who are called. Well, who on earth is that? Well, we can't talk about those being called without going to Romans 8. 30, the golden chain. I love the golden chain where Paul says to those who he predestined, those whom he predestined, those who he decided in advance, he also called. And to those he called, he also justified. And to those he justified, he also glorified. I love it when God speaks about things that he's going to do in the past tense. Because for God, time is a non-category for God. And so he says that, that those he decided in advance, those he predestined, he called every single one of them. He justified every single one of them. And he will glorify. He has glorified all. Already, every single one of them. That's who Jude is writing to. He's writing to us, to believers, to the church. And he describes them in this way. He says they are beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. I love also when God tells us who we are. I love when God tells us who we are. When he says this is who you are. And sometimes that is in contradiction to who we would say that we are. Oftentimes, that's in contradiction to who we say that we are. And here he describes us as being beloved in God the Father. I, when I, every time I think of the word beloved, uh, you know, we talked about being beloved in 1 John. I think we would preach an entire message about being beloved. But I can't help but, but envision, I envision the wedding feast. You know, after the resurrection, when we're united in heaven at the, at the wedding feast of the bride of Christ and the lamb, and there's a, there's a table at the wedding feast. You can't have a, a feast without a table, and there's chairs at the table. You can't sit at a feast without chairs, and on, on the chairs, on the back of them are names, and on the back of your chair is inscribed your label that God has given to you beloved and, and you're going to pull this chair God will pull it for you the, the, the father as you sit at the wedding feast and, and he has labeled you as beloved and then he tells us that we are kept for Jesus Christ and we're going to talk for the next three or four weeks about being kept 
All right, so I'm going to nerd out with grammar, Greek grammar for just a minute, if that's okay. Is that okay if I nerd out with Greek grammar for just a minute or two? So, kept here in the Greek, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Greek word, uh, but it is a perfect passive participle. A perfect passive participle. Now, I teach Latin, so that means something to me. That may not mean anything to you, but I'm going I'm to describe it a little bit. I'll do the best I can. So, as a participle, and, and, and this is important, this has meaning. There, there's a reason that it is a perfect passive participle. As a participle, it is a verb that describes either a noun or another verb. And so, here, the verb uh, kept is describing those who are called. And those who are called is a masculine, plural, dative word, implying that it is an indirect object. Again, as a, as a Latin teacher, kind of, I understand that a little bit. But as a perfect passive participle, we don't really have the perfect tense in English. It doesn't really translate exactly. But listen to what this actually means. Perfect means complete. It's, it's finished. There is... Nothing else that needs to be done. There's no more work required. It's perfect. It's complete. We are kept. Past tense. Kept. It's a passive participle. What does passive imply? That implies that the object that is being modified is not the one doing the work or the action. It is done by another, as we are kept. There is some intense meaning in just the grammar of that single word that we are kept, the perfect passive participle. And again, we're going to dig into that single word for about the next three or four weeks leading up to Christmas as we talk about being kept. So as I was thinking about us being kept... It, it occurred to me that there are some implications from the, the idea that we are kept. And one of those is that we have to be kept from something. And kept means to be guarded, to preserve, uh, to be preserved, secured, uh, uh, preserved and guarded from things around you. Not necessarily removed from, but protected in some way. That's what kept means here in this context. So that implies that we need to be kept from something. And so we're going to talk about the things we need to be kept from. And we're going to talk about some ugliness right up front. I'm sorry, we're going to talk about some ugliness. We're going to get through the ugliness and get back to the good part. But there's some hard parts in the Bible. There's, there's some ugliness in the Bible. And we're going to talk about that right up front as we talk about the things that we are kept from. So we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to go through the text here a little bit. You can follow along with me or you can just listen along. And we're going to start down in verse 4. Start down in verse 4. We're kept from certain people who've crept in unnoticed. Certain people have crept in unnoticed. And long ago, they were designated for this condemnation. Boy, that's a challenging, that, that clause right there is challenging. We could spend a lot of time just talking about that singular clause. Well, who are these certain people that have crept in unnoticed? It says they're ungodly people. Ungodly people have crept in unnoticed. And they do a couple of things right there in verse 4. They do two things. They pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. It doesn't say exactly how they do that, only that they do that. There's a number of different ways all of us can and do slander and pervert the grace of God. And then they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And so this is what we are being kept from. Now in verse 5 through verse 7, this is a really hard section of scripture right here because he reminds them. He says, I need to remind you of some things. You knew these things long ago, but allow me to refresh your memory just a little bit. And he reminds them that of three things. First of all, he says it was Jesus who saved the people out of Israel. And right here we have a, a affirmation of the triune nature of God as he presents Jesus as the one who saved the people out of Israel. Jesus is nowhere mentioned directly like that in the Old Testament account of the people being freed from bondage in Egypt. But here he says it is Jesus who saved them. But then afterward, 
He destroyed those who did not believe. That kind of shatters our notion, our casual view of Jesus as kind of our homeboy. You know, Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my friend. Here he says, Jesus is the one who saved them and then, then destroyed those who did not believe. Again, that's a, that's a tough passage to think about. And then he talks about angels. Angels who did not stay in their position of authority. He's, he's talking about the fall of Satan and his angels right there. They rejected authority. And what is he doing with them? He's keeping them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Again, that's, that's tough right there. That's a tough passage to consider. And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. They the actual language there is strange flesh. And they served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. He's reminding them of these things, that these are hard truths, that this is serious business. He's reminding them of the stakes of the game. That eternity hangs in the balance as we consider the things that he's about to tell us. This is infinitely important. This is perhaps more important than anything else we could ever hear. Because look at the stakes. This is what has happened previously. And so please listen to me as I go on to explain the rest of this. Is what Jude is saying. Because in verse 8 he says, in the same manner. There's other people, these people who have crept in unnoticed. And here he tells us that they do three things. They defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, defiling of the flesh. Just like the angels who rejected authority. And just like Israel who blasphemed the name of God when they began to worship other gods alongside the worship of their own God. So they're doing the exact same thing that these three groups of people were judged for. And then he goes on to tell them in verse 11, woe to them. He's calling down judgment on them. He says they walked in the way of Cain. And how did Cain walk? Cain walked in jealousy. He walked in envy. He walked in pride. And so he rose up and he slew his brother. And then he talks about Balaam and Balaam's heir. Well, what was Balaam's heir? Balaam taught Balak. Balaam taught Balak to lead the people of God astray by tempting them. By tempting them. And then he says they perished in Korah's rebellion. Well, what was Korah's rebellion was a rejection of authority. A rejection of authority was Korah's rebellion. And then he goes on to talk about these people. And again, these are these are hard words. I mean, this isn't a cheery Christmas message, right? These are these are tough words. He says they are hidden reefs. Well, what is a reef? But something below the surface of the water that you cannot see until it tears the bottom off of your boat and your boat sinks. He says they are at the feast, our love feast, as they feast with us without fear. They're, they're taking communion with us. They're, they're, they're coming to our fellowships. Uh, we don't know who they are, but they're right here. And he says they are they're waterless clouds. What is a waterless cloud? But a cloud that, that promises rain, that promises a harvest, and it, it never delivers. What is it? It says they are fruitless trees. What is a, an apple tree that produces and generates no, no fruit? He says they are wandering stars. Think about the stars that we navigate by. If you're a sailor, maybe you know how to navigate by the stars. But can you consider if what would happen if the stars were wandering around and you were trying to, to navigate? Navigate by them that would lead you astray. And he says the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever for them. These are harsh words. These are tough words. And you might say, well, why are we talking about these hard words? There's so many other things we could be talking about. This isn't the only place. This is not the only place in Scripture that these kinds of words, this kind of language is used. This must be important stuff. Think back to 1 John. We spend a little bit of time in 1 John chapter 2 and, and chapter 3 talking about Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist. And what was the spirit of Antichrist? But that they were among us and they went out from us because they were not of us. But they weren't content just to go out from us. They sought to come back in and deceive us. And what did they seek to deceive us about? But who Jesus really is. They taught false things about Jesus. You go back to, to the words of Jesus even in Matthew 24, 24. And if he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, or he's talking about the end of all things, or maybe a little bit of both, doesn't matter. He says there will be false Christ, false teachers among you, and they will lead astray the elect if possible. 
If possible, you go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. The Apostle Peter, he borrows heavily from the book of Jude. Chapter 2 of 2 Peter is almost a quote of the book of Jude. He says, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. These are tough words. These are harsh words. But frequently throughout scripture, you see this. From the Apostle Paul to the Apostle Peter to Jew to Jesus himself. So these must be important words. There must be a reason that the Bible tells us these things over and over again. And that's what I want to drill into today is that this is a reminder. This is a reminder to us of the nature of our existence. That we all exist in a spiritual battle every single day. I don't know about you. You, may, you probably do better than me at this. You probably uh, do a little bit better than I do. But there are large swaths of my day, daily existence, where I don't think about the Lord. I'm not considering my walk. Again, maybe you do better than I do. <laughs> my sons, my sons, uh, two of my sons have a particular feud that is repetitive and reoccurring. And this particular feud, when I am called upon to arbitrate, the nature of it is that it is absolutely impossible to ascertain who's at fault. I mean, it's absolutely impossible. And so I'm left with one of two options. Sometimes I go with option A. You guys figure it out. I, I don't want to hear it again. Again, this is repetitive and a, a habitual dispute that occurs. Nina's shaking her head. She knows what I'm talking about here. The other option is I come in and I, and I slice the, 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 the proverbial Gordian knot, right? Because as parents, we are much more interested in quiet than we are in justice, correct, at some point in time. And it's absolutely impossible to decide who is at fault here. And when I'm presented with this, the last thing I'm thinking about is my walk with the Lord. I'm thinking about how frustrated I am that I'm being presented with this life on a daily basis where I'm not considered my walk with the Lord. But you know who is considering my walk with the Lord at all times? The enemy is considering my walk. The Lord and the enemy is always. I'm not thinking about him, but I assure you, he is thinking about me. Because again, when we look at these Passages, it's a reminder to us because some people will present the Christian walk in a different way. The Christian walk is not one of puppies and rainbows and, and sunshine and moonbeams. That is not the Christian walk. The Christian walk is a life of, of hardship. It's a night fight. It's a dog fight every single day, whether you realize it or not. And what Jude is telling us is that this is deliberate. This is intentional. This isn't accidental. These people are coming in deliberately to lead astray the elect even if they could and their greatest enemy is secrecy right up front he says that they, they crept in unnoticed it's not like they got a banner they don't they don't come in and say hey false teacher leading you astray they don't wear a lapel pin i mean maybe we could get them red blazers or well that's for the the welcome committee we'll get uh, maybe purple blazers uh, well that's royal so maybe we'll get green blazers i don't know something to identify but they don't identify themselves they come in unnoticed they come in secretly peter tells us there's a deeper issue though i think when i think about people teaching false stuff about the lord there's, there's a deeper issue i believe and i want so i want to take it one step a little bit deeper when we think about this and that is what is the fruit of false teachings false teachings about jesus they can't lead us straight the elect i'm kept i'm preserved i'm sealed by the holy spirit unto him but what can be accomplished? What are the stakes? Our world is hard enough as it is. Our world is hard enough as it is. We do pretty good here at the way at masking and hiding our afflictions. Now, we don't dress as nice as some churches do, uh, but historically, we have a pretty straight-laced congregation. If you just look at it, you say, hey, these guys got their stuff together. These guys are squared away, no real problems here. But I will tell you that if you peel back the onion a little bit, if you just lift the veil a little bit and look, every nature of affliction, 
And maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, I'm that person that has this front that I put up, but I'm suffering. You know, maybe you're loving somebody that's suffering under an addiction or you're suffering under an addiction yourself, or maybe somebody's done something to you or God is not doing something in your life or, you, or God is doing something and you don't understand what it is that he is doing. Maybe you're suffering in some way because there is suffering here in this body of believers. There's suffering in every body of believers. And the issue is when we are suffering, when we're struggling, we are supposed to have the solid rock of the risen Lord Jesus to rest upon. But what about when people start to chip away at the solid rock of the foundation of our faith, which is who the risen Lord Jesus is. And so Jesus, Jude, tells us that we are kept. Well, how are we kept? I want to talk about that. How does he keep us? How has this happened? Well, one of the ways is by the letter of Jude itself. I mean, this, this is a grace of God that we even have this letter. He's given this to us and said, here, here, beware, be vigilant, be alert, be on guard, be on the lookout. There are people that are trying to undermine the foundations of your faith, who Jesus is. Jesus talked about it. Peter talked about it. Jude talked about it. So here, <clears throat> take these letters. Take this letter and be vigilant. Be aware. Be watchful. Be on guard. This is a grace. This is one of the ways that we are kept and have been kept by the risen Lord Jesus. And the other way is that this gives us a benchmark. When we are hearing things, when we're seeing things, we can go right to the letter Jude and say, well, hey. Is this within the bounds of orthodoxy? So a number of years ago, <clears throat> my family and I visited a church, uh, a, a hyper, turned out to be a hyper charismatic church. Now, again, I don't uh, impugn uh, charismatic. I mean, depending on how you label that word, define that word, you know, some people define me as a charismatic. And so, you know, that, that's okay. This was a hyper charismatic church. And so I'm sitting in this church service. And things begin to occur that troubled me. And so I instantly flipped to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, the section entitled Lying Prophets. And as I listened, I had the book of Jeremiah 23 open, and I was just going, oh, check, check, check. Honey, we need to get the kids and, and leave. And we did. We got, the, we got the children up and we walked out of the church. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 23. He says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesied lies in my name, saying, here's what lying prophets say. They said, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who do what? They prophesied the deceit in their own hearts. He says this before that. If they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed what? My words. To the people. If they had stood in the counsel of the Lord, they would have proclaimed his words, not their words, not the lies in their own heart, not the contents of some kind of dream that they may have had. And so when I think about the letter Jude, again, we can talk about a couple of different things, a lot of different things, actually, just from the section we went through. I want to talk about three things that he has, that he has pointed out to us that we must be wary of. And the first thing is our leadership. Is our leadership. It's no coincidence that as bodies of believers drift into unorthodoxy or maybe even heresy, entire denominations drift in that regard. They don't drift. They're led. They're led in that direction. And so God has given us the letter of Jude and other letters to take a look at our leaders and say, are our leaders doing the things we need them to do? Are they feeding shepherds, feeding themselves? Are your shepherds feeding themselves, relying on their dreams? If you were to summarize the biblical role of an elder, it would be to feed the people who are under the purview a steady diet of the word of God. To shepherd the people, to protect the people from all of these things. That would be a, a summation of the biblical call of an elder. 
Or are your elders, your teachers, your leaders saying, I had a dream, I had a dream, uh, that, that God said to me in this dream, the Lord is telling me to tell you this, or is he feeding you a steady diet of the word of God? We must stand upon the word of God, and we must feed the word of God, and if they are not, then that is an issue, Jude tells us. we got to be wary of. i got to tell you, when I, when I preach, I mean, the last thing, I, I don't want to give you any of me, I want to give you none of me. You don't want any of me. You want the word. You want the Lord. And so that is my prayer that you would never hear anything of me, that you would always hear mainly what the word of God, or all that the word of God would have to say. So our leadership is an issue. Let's talk about authority. Let's talk about authority. We see that consistent theme throughout these, these uh, groups pointed out by Jude is a rejection of authority. Every believer, every believer is called to submit in multiple different ways. Submission these days is a dirty word. It can be a dirty word sometimes. It's a word that people don't like. We're all called to submit to the local church, to the leaders of the local church. We're all called to submit to the government, to every human institution. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, submit to your parents. Uh, servants, submit to your masters. And you can make a, a strong exegetical argument there of workers, submit to your employers. I mean, I, I would preach that saying we're all called to submit in some way, and we're all called to submit to the authority of Scripture. And so one of the first places I will go if I'm checking out a, a church or something, and when I go to their website, is hey, where's, the, where's their statement of beliefs? What do they believe? And, uh, you know, I'll go to their, uh, their, their profiles of their leaders first and see if the leaders look weird or something like that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I hope they don't look at ours. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, but then I go to their statement of beliefs. Somewhere near the top, it better say something about the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture. If it doesn't, that's an issue. And again, it's no coincidence that when groups of, of believers, churches, entire bodies, entire denominations are led into heresy or unorthodoxy, one of the first things they do is deny the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture. And so that's an issue. If we are never, if we are ever to come to a situation where our faith walk does not revolve around the Word of God, you ought to get up and walk, you ought to challenge the leadership of this church, and then you ought to get up and walk out if you are not satisfied with the response. So leadership, authority, and the last thing I want to talk about is sin. We see this common theme throughout uh, Jude, the letter of Jude, that these, these leaders who creep in unnoticed, they embrace sin. It's not that they're sin. I mean, they're sin. Everybody's a sinner. We're all sinners. Everybody struggles with sin. But is there a struggle? Is it a struggle? Or do we embrace it? Do we justify it? Do we promote it? Do we say, look how gracious we are, just like the church at Corinth with the things that we tolerate? Do we, do we revel in our sin? And we see this consistent theme through this list of people that Jude is talking about. And we want to get to a place like in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, where Paul says, we will no longer be children. We don't want to be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. We want to be founded, solid in the word of God, which tells us who the risen Lord Jesus is. So I'm going to close with Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3. Can we get Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3 up there? That's not the verse I was thinking of. <laughs> Maybe I gave them the wrong address. 43 verse 2. Is what you 43 up. verse 2. I probably gave them the wrong address. Abolish that verse from the screen. <laughs> and you can flip to that with me if you would like. Or you can just listen. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2. Word of God says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Consider what these verses are saying. When, when you pass through the waters, when you walk through the fire, the rivers will not overwhelm you. You're not going to be burned. You're not going to be consumed. He will be with you. You are kept. You are kept. Past tense. Perfect. 
passive participle. Those who are being called are kept. And so when we look at a passage like this, when we look at a passage like this, and we consider where we are at in our walk, maybe you're in the river now. Maybe you're in the fire now. We must reject. We must reject as a lie any teaching or any person who would tell us anything other than this verse right here. The reason you're in the water is that you don't have enough faith. The reason that you're being burned is that you're not walking well, is that you don't have enough faith. There's something wrong if there is a fire. There's something wrong if there is water. You can rise up under your own strength. You can rise up under your own power and jump over the water or run around the fire. The Lord is not with you in the fire. He would never be burned. He would never be in the water. So we must reject all of those types of teachings who would tell us anything other than this. Because that is the second order effect of false teachings. They're not going to lead you astray. If you are chosen of God, you will be glorified. You have been glorified. But what they can do is chip away at the foundations of your faith. What is the first uh, angle that Satan worked in the garden? But doubt. And so as we deal with fires, as we deal with the water, the raging rivers, we must go back to the source to make sure that our foundation is that strong and that we are kept. And these are the things that we are kept from. You're going to come out the other side. God is going to pull you through the river to the other side. It's already happened. You're kept. You're going to come through the fire, not unscathed, not consumed, but refined. It's going to happen. It's already happened. Time is a non-category for God. So wherever you are, find comfort and rest in the fact that it has already happened. The work is already done. Maybe it hasn't manifested itself yet in our reality. So I'm going to close in prayer. Joe's going to come and pray. And so my question today for us as believers is would we claim this title for ourselves, this idea that we are kept? Would we claim that for ourselves, that we are beloved, that we are kept as we are called? That today would be the day that we would embrace, that we would claim this label that God has applied to us. And that we would be alert for the things that he is keeping us from. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. We praise you. God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that you would take us and, and, and label us and proclaim this label to us. God, that you have kept us. God, that in the river, I'm going to be in the river. Sometimes I put myself in the river. I know that. Maybe the river's there uh, as a dis I, Whatever the reason. The river's there. The fire is there. God, we know that. But I know because your word just told me that you're there with me. You're there with me in the river. You're there with me in the fire. And you're going to pull me through the river. You're going to pull me through the fire. I know that because your word tells me that. And so, God, we reject anyone, we reject anything that would tell us anything different than that. We reject anyone that would teach us or try to convince us of anything other than that truth. We reject all things, all people, all systems, all things that would try to tell us anything different about you, Lord. Because we know who you are. You are a God who has called us. You predestined us. You have called us. You have justified us. You have glorified us. You're a God who takes us and sticks a label on us and says, you are beloved even when I am unlovable, even when I reject you, even when I turn away from you, even when I'm not even thinking about you. I have been labeled. I have been declared beloved. I have been declared kept. And so we embrace that today, God. We embrace that today. And so, God, we just love you and we praise you. We just, we're so thankful for your word. Uh, and I pray that you're moving in the hearts of the people, even here today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand and sing? If you'd like to come and, and pray with me down where you can, pray right where you are. And. Uh...